Hello, and thank you so much for watching this documentary. Before we get into the video, I want to give you a brief history of how this project came about and my motivations for doing this. When I initially started at Stanford as a freshman, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor by any means necessary, but I didn't quite know how to get there, right? Everyone had been telling me, get into a good school, get into a good college, get into a good college, and then, you know, figure out the rest later. So when I had finally gotten to Stanford, I didn't have a... A direction anymore and I felt like I didn't have resources or anyone to talk to about my journey or to help me and keep me motivated I wasn't doing well in my pre-med classes I was getting C's I wasn't building my resume I wasn't doing anything to make myself a competitive applicant so I decided to take a break from pre-med classes after taking a break from pre-med I decided to give myself a second chance my junior year I started taking biology courses again I started organic chemistry biochemistry I really delved back into all the prerequisites required for medical school and I started to do more like start to get involved in volunteering at a free clinic and to research start to do more things to make me competitive and throughout my journey it made me upset how little support I feel like I received from certain resources or certain places and I felt like there just wasn't enough people of color to talk to about my journey my struggles and to validate how I felt so I was talking with my advisor Dr. Paul Fisher telling him how I wanted to create a documentary about black women in medicine as a personal project to put on my YouTube channel and through talking with him he suggested why don't you just turn this into your senior synthesis project for your major needless to say without the advising of Dr. Fisher and Dr. Preston along with support from the Humboldt department this documentary would literally be impossible. So a huge thank you to the Humbile Department as well as the Bingham Fund for Innovation. Thank you guys so much for turning my dream into reality. I'm hoping that this documentary as well as the videos I post on YouTube inform, encourage, and motivate students of color to stay through this journey because we need you. We need more doctors of color. I sat down with five unique and amazing black physicians and interviewed them about their journey to medicine, the obstacles they faced throughout the journey, as well as the rewards of going into medicine. With this documentary, I hope to show that there are people of color in medicine but we need more. The journey to medicine is not easy but these women show me that it's definitely worth it. It's time for a conversation with black women in medicine. So uh, for me uh, the journey to medicine actually started when I was probably five years old. I remember distinctly um, really just kind of being enamored by my pediatrician uh, Dr. Defoe uh, who worked at Santa Cruz Medical and I remember just wanting to know more about what he did and why did he get to take care of children and I remember being pretty clear and wanting to learn about his profession and asking him specifically what is it that you do and once he told me what a pediatrician was and that they're a physician who takes care of children and once I learned how to spell it correctly probably by second grade I was already telling my friends that I wanted to be a pediatrician um, that being said, I definitely took a little bit of a roundabout path to pursuing that, uh, but it's something that definitely stuck with me at such a really young and early age. I knew I wanted to care for children um, and really kind of empower children to take care of themselves and improve their health. I would say that there was no one particular event or no particular epiphany, uh, but uh, perhaps more a series of life experiences uh, that um, culminated in my making that final decision. I would say that um, growing up, I always felt the desire to make the best use of my, my talents. And so in the back of my mind, um, being in a noble profession like medicine was always um, something I thought highly of, um, but I did not wish to restrict myself completely to that particular goal, but ultimately, um, when other experiences, um, um, you know, came, um, individuals in my family with various illnesses, um, trying to understand uh, the kinds of stigmas that would be attached to um, diseases such as cancer really made me uh, want to understand that more, and I believe that all of that together uh, culminated in, in my making a final decision to, to pursue medicine. Well, I think initially it was exposure as a young child. My father is a dentist and in the Kansas City community where I grew up, a lot of his friends, very good friends, were physicians. And so I just was exposed to a lot of doctors and and I was drawn to it naturally and I think that 
what drew me to it so much was being able to interact with people and just having a general interest in the human body and in science and that really carried through throughout my life frankly. I, um, when I think about that question I think back to uh, when I was a little girl, I think I was probably about nine years old, and that was when I decided that I was going to be a pediatrician. And then shortly thereafter, I discovered what a neonatologist was. Um, and I had heard the term babies and bubbles, and it just sounded fabulous to me. So I decided that's what I thought I needed to do. Um, I had no idea exactly what that entailed or what it meant. Um, or what the life of a doctor was to be like, um, but that was what I decided I needed to do. In part because um, I was raised um, knowing that uh, being a doctor was something that was prestigious, it was something that meant you had education, um, and uh, it was something where you could help people. And so putting all those things together made a lot of sense, and uh, that's how I um, decided, well, I'm going to be a doctor. My journey to medicine. So, um, I don't think I had a particularly atypical path. Um, I, other than that, I'm an immigrant to the U.S., right? So I was born in Jamaica, and we immigrated when I was in grammar school. Um, and then I think from there, my path was probably fairly standard. Like, I went to high school and um, did well in high school, went to college, did well in college, went to medical school. Um, and then in medical school, um, I uh, spent a lot of time trying to, you know, as everyone does, uh, find that perfect fit at disciplines and um, and then uh, chose a, a fairly atypical subspecialty though. Um, but uh, but even my uh, training in neurosurgery was pretty, pretty straightforward as well. Um, and then I decided to go into academic medicine. Um, and uh, and so have been have had benefit of practicing at two outstanding institutions like Stanford and Emory. Um, and so I think the path itself, I think um, if you look at it from the outside in, was fairly straightforward. Um, but if you kind of zoom in, um, I think the differences are that you know uh, being an African American or Jamaican American or however you want to 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 um, to tag me. Um, uh, that in and of itself, I think, stands out, um, and and it was different, right? So, you know, in high school, uh, very few um, African American children in my high school, as you could imagine. Then I went to Dartmouth, which is an incredibly homogenous environment, um, even from an immigrant standpoint, um, and even if I weren't an immigrant and an African American, I think that too would have been noteworthy. Um, and then uh, at Stanford Medical School my year, I was the only African American woman in my class, um, and I think that would have stood out. And then neurosurgery uh, is a very male-dominated uh, subspecialty um, or specialty. And the year I finished my residency, there were seven other women who completed neurosurgery in the country that year, so eight of us total. So again, if you zoom in, you would see some of those um, differences. Um, and then, of course, being on faculty, I think as an African-American woman um, uh, nationwide as a neurosurgery faculty, that is noteworthy. Um, and then even at Stanford, women and minorities being part of the professoriate is also quite uh, rare. So, um, so I think all of those things in aggregate have made the path um, again, from the outside, seem really straightforward, but I think if you zoom in, there are going to be those differences. Yeah. So my path to medicine was pretty traditionally linear. I went to undergraduate, um, I did complete my undergraduate studies at University of Delaware. Um, in a somewhat non-traditional way, I decided not to be a classical pre-med or traditional pre-med, um, and so I majored in chemistry. Um, I wanted to really immerse myself in really understanding um, science uh, for science and not necessarily for the grade um, and, and pursued a lot of opportunities for research. I didn't know at the time that that one was even possible to be connected um, with a career in medicine because it was such basic research, but ultimately um, with all of my experiences um, at the end of um, my undergraduate studies decided um, that I would pursue medicine and to my delight um, there were medical schools who were interested in individuals who had that more research intensive bent and so um, Stanford was a really um, wonderful place for that. 
Now in terms of any times where I felt like I might give up, I would say that it was not necessarily during those early days. Um, I completely immersed myself, I believe, in my undergraduate studies, really wanting to um, uh, really uh, take advantage of that kind of intellectual curiosity that I had from, from multiple disciplines. Um, and I did not know that that one was in a way um, really shaping me um, to be um, someone who would, would fit well with, with medicine. And so those early days were not the times where I felt um, the, the um, a possibility of giving up. I would say the only time I, I really felt a time where I had to reflect on whether or not this one was the right path for me, it was one of a more philosophical um, uh, journey. Uh, one where in one of my early clinical rotations, um, I felt like, you know, my personality, certainly back then, was one of being somewhat quiet, reserved, um, doing my work and working hard. Uh, but somehow in this early clinical rotation, fitting in with the team and hearing, you know, jokes and, and statements, um, in my opinion, disparaging patients was not something I wanted to contribute to. And so I stepped back and was brought into um, the office of the professor to, for an evaluation. and you know, being told, well, you're not like our usual medical student, made me question at that point in time if I have to give up my own values about um, respect for people, is this profession really for me? And in the end, spoke up for myself um, and asked that person, well, you know, am I doing things that we're supposed to be doing? Am I doing the notes correctly? Am I presenting well? Am I making sure that things are done? And they're saying, say yes. So in it reflecting, I said, well, so what's the problem? And so I believe in that moment it gave that person a chance to reflect on that as well. And in the end, I did get a, um, a glowing you know, evaluation. And I knew in that moment that I didn't have to give up on my own personal you know, values of, of really being respectful of, of people. Um, and you know, medicine is a different kind of culture, and sometimes people do things to kind of get by because of some of the really tough things that we have to deal with, and that might have been their way, but it certainly wasn't mine. And so um, I'm glad that the culture of medicine could actually accommodate my personal values. And so that one would be probably the only time that I, I felt some at least pause is about whether or not this one was the place. The path to uh, medicine can definitely lead you down many different routes. Uh, for me specifically, I came to Stanford actually in undergrad. I knew that I wanted to be an engineer at that time because I was taking a physiology class in high school. And at that time, um, the really kind of cool thing that was going on was bioengineering research. And that's when Dolly the sheep was being cloned. And I was like, this is the most interesting field. What is that field? What do you do to get into it? And they're like, it's a bioengineer. So I kind of switched you know, routes and said I wanted to be an engineer and applied to colleges that had great engineering programs, Stanford being one of them. And was very fortunate and lucky to get into Stanford and kind of pursued that route of becoming a bioengineer and what that kind of meant. Um, quickly into freshman year, I realized there was more that took kind of like what it took to become a bioengineer. I, I went the route of biomechanical engineering, uh, which was a great kind of course to kind of pursue, uh, but I quickly realized there was a lot of classes that it involved, and it was really hard to balance both being a pre-med and an engineer at the same time. Uh, so I kind of stuck with bioengineering and kind of followed that route uh, and took some time in between before applying to medical school. Um. Unfortunately, I think I'm probably among the most linear you'll come across when it comes to my road to medicine. Uh, looking back, I would have done it very differently um, and uh, explored more and done more before I jumped on this road to medicine. But it was um, kind of all I knew and I thought that you were just supposed to go for it and get your goal and do it. And so that's how I pursued it. Even from when I was in high school, I knew that I was supposed to focus on the sciences. So um, I remember nearly failing biology in 
high school and still thinking, oh my gosh, I have to do great in biology, what am I going to do? Um, and so I stayed focused through high school. I went to a college um, that I would say, I guess this was not as linear, that I went to a liberal arts, a really small liberal arts college. But even once there, I focused on biology as my major and um, then realized that I had other interests like sociology towards the end. And so I actually minored in sociology. Um, it was during my college years that I linked up with one of my biology professors and did a summer program uh, in biology, which was actually really cool. We um, basically did surgery on um, mice hearts, and um, it was really kind of a neat thing that I was doing. Um, and uh, so I continued in my science courses, and I did enjoy them. Um, but that was kind of all I knew. I didn't look left. I didn't look right. I didn't think about, oh, I could do some other fabulous traveling or do some other fabulous career before I go into um, medicine. I didn't know to do that. I didn't know to uh, look for that. Um, I think in hindsight, I probably would have. Um, but so my course was very linear. Um, things that discouraged me along the way were my grades. It was hard. Biology was really hard. Um, I was always going in for extra help from the teachers. I nearly failed organic chemistry uh, and had to go in repeatedly to the professor. Um, I uh, really sunk all of my time into figuring out what I was supposed to be learning um, in a lot of my science classes. My other ones were fine. It was mostly the science classes because I knew that I needed to have decent grades in those. Um, I went along with the rest of the group that was um, kind of pre-med, so to speak, at my college um, and took the MCAT. I had no idea what I was doing. I also went along with the group again and took some MCAT course and just did what I heard other people doing and what I saw other people doing and I prayed a lot. So <laughs> I prayed really, really hard. <laughs> and. Um, did a lot of MCAT questions and by the grace of God, I didn't do horrible on the MCAT. I didn't do great, but it was like a number that was semi-presentable. Um, and so uh, I put that into my, my portfolio. Um, and um, shortly thereafter, I remember doing, they had a uh, committee that would like prep you for, um, at my school, they had a committee that would prep you for your um, medical school interviews. And um, the director of our biology department um, had me uh, do a mock interview with her to prepare. And I remember her saying how um, surprised she was at how well spoken I was and how I presented on my interview and how um, just, I could kind of pull it together. I think, I don't know why she was so surprised. I think part of it was because she didn't know me. Um, I don't know what she was expecting. Of course, I was at a small liberal arts college, so yes, I was one of few minorities there. And even fewer going into medicine. I know there was one other now colleague of mine who is amazing, um, at the time who was also on the same track that I was. We ran track together. Um, we applied to med school uh, at the same time, and so um, we were the only two, I think, that she probably knew of or had come across, at least in my year, that were applying. Um, so I applied. I went on my interviews. Um, they went okay. They, um, there was nothing remarkable about them. Um, with the exception of uh, the schools that I did interview at, I really remember trying to take time and think about what was going to be a good fit for me and how I felt at the school and if I felt like it was a welcoming and nurturing environment. Um, and so uh, that was how I kind of narrowed down um, where I thought I wanted to go. Of course, this was all dependent on who accepted me. Um, so 
I was accepted by uh, a couple of schools, waitlisted by a couple, and that was pretty much it. Um, and so I chose to go to a school that I really actually did enjoy the interview uh, process at. And um, I went to Georgetown uh, University School of Medicine, and it turned out to be a really good fit. Um, so that kind of describes, I guess, the first portion of my journey into medicine. My path is anything but linear, actually. And I started, um, I was one of those kids who said, oh, I want to be a doctor my entire life. And I can distinctly remember saying, I want to be a surgeon. I distinctly remember saying, I don't want to have children because as a surgeon, I'm not going to have time for children. <laughs> and I remember thinking that um, there was no other profession for me. When I got to undergrad here at Stanford, actually, um, I majored in human biology. And then I will tell you that I was one of those students who was involved in so many other things. I really did not have, I didn't have the time to, to devote to being a pre-med student at that time, honestly. Uh, I was in a singing group, I was in Ram's Head, doing theater, um, I was in a band, I really was doing a lot of other things outside of classes, and I'll tell you, I was also one of the people who didn't enjoy chemistry that much when I was doing my prerequisites, and it was relatively easy to not go to chemistry class, and so then I would drop chemistry class, <laughs> and at the end, you know, you cannot be pre-med if you're not doing your pre-med requirements. So, I remember speaking to my advisor here, and he mentioned a post-baccalaureate program. And I said, hmm, that sounds like it could be for me. And I changed my major to French and um, took six years off between graduating from Stanford and starting medical school. And in between that time, I did a lot of performing. I went to performing arts school. I lived in Paris for about six months, and then I went to performing arts school in New York and did some performing and then eventually got into a financial firm and was still auditioning during that time. But when our group went, well, they had just some big layoffs and that's when I decided, okay, it's time for me to buckle down and prepare for medical school. So that's when I started doing my post-baccalaureate in New York City and um, I took the MCAT. That was another big, big, flag in my history is that I did fine on the biology section, I can't remember all the sections now, biology, whatever. I will say that my verbal score was horrendous. And when I say horrendous, I'm saying I'm not even going to say what it was right now because I'm embarrassed. <laughs> but I got into medical school nonetheless, thank goodness. And um, and that's where it all started. I went to medical school and then came back to Stanford for my training. Um, and I actually have to tell you that in that time that I took the six years, as I said, I did some performing, I did some traveling, I got married, just lots of wonderful things that I was able to do in my life before medicine um, and still have the dedication to medicine when I came back to it. And Another important thing I want to tell you is that when I did those post back classes, it was a completely different experience. So I was ready, I was focused, and I actually enjoyed organic chemistry, which is shocking. I never thought I would be saying that after my experience with it the first time. But I really enjoyed it, and that made a huge difference. Um, and I think just by nature of starting another career and then coming back to medicine, two other careers actually, and, but, and coming back to medicine, I think that showed that I was really ready to pursue it and that I really wanted it. And you know, if you're thinking about resilience, that was, that was the evidence for that resilience there. Steve. Right, so I think, you know, people always talk about like immigrant mentality um, 
And of course, when you're living it, you don't actually know what that means or feel like that's any different. But um, looking back on my experience, um, I think that was a big part of it. Like when you're an immigrant, you're here for a reason. Your parents are driven for a reason. You're driven for a reason. Um, and so it's a very different mental landscape, right? So I don't know that it's resilience per se. I think it's basically uh, focused determination, right? Um, I also think that um, for better or for worse, I've always lived in what I've what I affectionately call like my own bubble, right? So I don't really look to the right and look to the left and see what other people are doing. Like this is my goal, this is what I would like, and I'm just going to move forward. And so I've just really been, um, to some extent, immune to a lot of those influences because I've just really sort of been incredibly focused. Um, with that said, though. I know for a fact that you know much of my success hinders or hinges on mentors and people who have really stepped up to make sure that I stayed that focused and that driven. Um, and there were many, you know, I, I, this was not a sole path, right? So, I mean, from my parents, my grandparents, you know, et cetera. And then academically, like I've just had the best, best mentors ever. Um, and. Um, that undoubtedly plays a role in, in, in everyone's success. And I think it's hard. I, I know a few people who are like, I did this all by myself, you know? Um, and if they say that, then I actually look at them a little bit askew as well, because I'm not sure that that's at all possible. Um, it's a long haul. I mean, I started school when I was three. I finished residency when I was 33. So it's a 30 year path. Um, and all along I have just had, um, the best support system um, uh, but but I also think it's important to not to not let like other people get into your head or into your world to just really stay focused I think that to stay motivated and not give up um, I think my biggest thing was I probably just took it in smaller chunks like I wasn't looking ahead at where I needed to go I was looking at the right here right now so um, the courses that I was failing, <laughs> I was having my like, oh no moments where I would look and be like, I'm getting an F. I need to not at least get, at least to not get an F. And it was never a direct correlation of, oh, because I'm getting an F in this course, I'm not going to get to where I need to be. It was more just sheer mortification that I was getting F in a course. <laughs> and so for some reason, I didn't even link the two at the time. And I think... I was very short-sighted in some ways um, because I just stayed very focused and almost traumatized at times by um, my uh, grades that I was getting or the experiences that I was having. Um, and part of it, I think, has to do with my um, persistence on things and um, it's a part of who I am and it and, and, and my dedication and loyalty. Uh, so it's something that is my blessing and my burden. It gets me into trouble sometimes because I just don't let go of things I probably should. <laughs> um, but I think part of it was also my persistence and I just never, I'm, I'm really that person that does not give up. <laughs> Unless I've tried every absolute avenue and it's just I'm about to lose my life, literally, then I may give up. Okay, thank you. Did you have any faculty or any pillars of support while in undergrad or like that helped you throughout your applying to medical school or your medicine journey? Absolutely. I mean, I think the biggest ones were my family. Um, and God, I, you know, was a praying woman and I prayed myself through the process and my family prayed me through the process. I think along the way there were people who I may or may not have known were also a part of my story and a part of my journey. And for those people, I'm thankful for them. Um, I'm especially thankful for, you know, my biology professor who um, let me join her uh, in um, a project over uh, one of my summers in undergrad. Her name was Beth Bailey, and um, we did some really cool work with mice hearts, and I loved it. Um, and it was people like that who really kind of extended themselves 
um, and gave me whatever stepping stone that I needed. Uh, I think there were also people who had come before me who I reached out to. So they were people who had either gone to my school who had gone into medicine um, or um, those people had connected me to somebody else and so those were people who I reached out to to find out, okay, what are the next steps? Or, hey, I'm coming for a med school interview, can I stay at your place? Um, or do you know somebody at your um, institution? Um, can you put in a good word for me? Uh, those types of things. Thank you. So I just want to go into like your experiences in medical school. What, because so I hear I haven't been to medical school, of course, <laughs> but I hear it's pretty intensive and that like there's a lot of like stuff that you learn within those four years. How are you able to keep the fire and like passion in medical school even when it felt like there was so much? Did you feel like you were competing with people at medical school? Did you feel isolated? Did you feel like you were on your own track? Like how did you really guide yourself through medical school? All of those things competing on the wrong track, on the right track, off track, <laughs> alone, but sometimes feeling like I was working with people but then still finding out, mm, no, in the end you're kind of on your own. Um, I felt all of those things in medical school. I remember in my first semester um, we had a course embryology which I nearly failed. Um, and it was one of the first courses in medical school and it was eye-opening for me because it was information that I couldn't quite get. I was horrible at understanding embryology. Um, it was very much about memorization. I don't even know how they tested us, but it was all like rote memorization. And I hadn't quite gotten how I was supposed to study in medical school. Um, and how I was supposed to take tests in medical school. So um, later on what I found out is that to pass at least the traditional medical school model the way that it was when I was attending medical school, to pass medical school you needed to probably be a really good test taker at baseline, which I was not. Um, and um, you didn't necessarily have to master information, you just needed to have your way of memorizing it. And um, so once I figured that out, medical school became more doable for me. But I almost failed out my first semester. I remember getting, oh gosh, was it one of the, I don't remember which course it was that I got. We had to wait for the grades to come and I was home for Thanksgiving. and you have to, you know, I would get online and you just had to keep refreshing and I was refreshing to see when the grade would pop up. Then the grade popped up and it was like a 50 something percent, something ridiculous, something so bad I had never seen it before in my academic career. And I remember running down the stairs of my parents' house in absolute tears saying, I'm not going back, I'm not going back to medical school, I can't go back. And they're all saying, what's going on? Why can't you go back? You'll be fine. And I was saying, nope, I failed out. This means that I failed out. I'm done. I can't go back. Um, and once we kind of pulled me back together, um, I, I, I don't... I don't even remember how that problem got fixed, if it was a curve thing, if we had another exam when I went back. Um, but I did. It was, it was very eye-opening. It was very lonely feeling um, because people don't tell you when they fail. People don't tell you when they get A's. Everybody walks around like they're all getting A's and like they're all number one and you don't know who it is and who it isn't. Um, and it's even the people who you think look might be a little bit slow or not slow and the people who you think are at the top are not at the top. Um, so that um, is very isolating in some ways because you never know who you're talking to and you never know how a person is doing. A person will say, oh yeah, I'm not doing that well, I almost failed that, when they're not. Um, and that to me was mind-blowing. Like why would you, who cares? Why are you lying about your grades? Just we can join together here, we're doing this together, um, was kind of how I felt. Um, but I think I was very naive in that respect. Um, so 
how did I get back and just keep going? I think part of it was taking a break and being at home when all of that happened and then going back, um, being a little bit refreshed and getting after it again and saying, well, I can't fail now. And not to mention, um, I had a ridiculous amount of loans that were gonna have to be paid back somehow. So I had to make it through. So I think the first setback I experienced was actually freshman year uh, when I was trying to take like uh, chemistry and the intro engineering courses and had a full like 20 units and realizing I was not keeping up with all of the different science courses I needed to take. Um, so I actually went to the pre-med advisors here at that time and I met this wonderful woman, Ruby Mason, who is no longer um, working on campus but actually works at uh, Packard as a volunteer. Uh, but at that time, she was probably the first advisor to sit down and tell me that trying to juggle both and and do not as well uh, and one or the other was going to be a challenge especially if I wanted to pursue medicine and she was never kind of really negative or kind of pointed me astray from saying like you can't be a physician or you can't do this just more she just wanted to make sure I had the strongest you know GPA or application possible and that may have meant letting some things go and maybe extending my path and so um, just with her kind of guidance she kind of already talked about maybe considering doing a post -bac or taking summer school courses so that way I wasn't trying to do 20 plus units managing my major also being a pre-med so I took her advice to heart um, I actually did uh, physics as a summer course at Santa Clara University when I was doing research in the lab here at Stanford to kind of offset some of that course load and then I actually kind of knew in my heart that I was going to do a post back after graduating uh, from Stanford so I applied for the National Institutes of Health I think they still have this program it's called the intramural research training award and allows you to do research at NIH um, with great faculty and um, investigators there, as well as take post back and kind of pre-med courses in between. And you're also surrounded by all these other kind of pre-meds who are kind of figuring out what to do in their gap year. So you have a great support system there. So I took about two years there to pursue research and then quickly realized I wanted to jump back into medicine. And during that time, I took you know, organic chemistry, I took biochemistry, just a lot of the classes that I um, didn't get a chance to take in undergrad because of my course load, but also the classes I really wanted to focus on and dedicate the time to. Um, so that was a great opportunity for me, but even with those two years, when I applied to medical school, I had some setbacks with that and actually enrolled in another post -bac program. How oh, can you talk more about that. Yeah, yeah. So when I was applying to medical school, I really didn't realize how kind of um, many med schools viewed uh, alternative paths or really kind of applicants who come in with different undergrad majors. So maybe they didn't come in with a biology major, major, maybe it wasn't chemistry, but coming in from like an engineering discipline or other humanities and realizing that might be weighed a little bit against you in some ways. Um, and then also knowing that I didn't have the strongest GPA, my MCAT score was just barely making the mark. And so uh, when I was applying for medical schools, I applied very broadly, also based on kind of the advice from peers and other advisors that I applied for both medical school and post -bac programs. And I was really fortunate that I got into the Ohio State University's MedPath program, which actually was one of the best kind of setups in that you do a year post -bac. You get to take um, also an MCAT review course through Princeton Review. So you're simultaneously working on your pre-med kind of course load as well as your MCATs at the same time. You're with a group of about 12. At that time, I think there was like 15 of us. So we all came in together with the same goal and they're still some of my best friends to this day. Um, and then during that time, I really got to build up that confidence uh, that I think sometimes um, can be you know, thwarted or lacking after going through such a hard path in undergrad um, that really was bolstered during the post -bac program. And so I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And then after finishing that year, I did an anatomy course over the summer and starting that following year, you have uh, automatic acceptance into medical school. So as long as you perform with a certain GPA level during your post -bac, and also as long as you pass your MCAT score, uh, you are already enrolled to the med school the following year.
Well, let me back up and just tell you where my um, my background comes from or my basis comes from. So I am now married to a black man in medicine. Um, and so uh, we have two, he and I have two very different perspectives. I think for him as a black man, he may have it in some ways the hardest, um, but at the same time, I feel like as a black woman, I have challenges that he doesn't have. Um, so I think that's what my lens is when I look at this um, and when I um, examine my position in medicine and how I respond to things. I was also raised in a household where my parents kind of told me like, yes, you're black and this is how you live and um, there's no, you, you, you need to put that aside and do what you need to do and get it done. And so uh, it was never, um, I was never taught to use the race card in any way. I was never taught to um, shy away because I was black um, or a woman. And in a lot of ways, the fact that I was a woman actually was never discussed in my home. So I didn't grow up thinking of like women's rights and can a woman do this? I didn't think about that more what was discussed was the fact that you're black regardless of whether you're a man or a woman you're a black person um, and so i take that with me um, and also knowing kind of where i come from and um, knowing that in a lot of ways i am very privileged to be able to do what i do live in the type of world that i currently live in um, and so uh, because of that that changes my view on things in a lot of ways. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is that I was raised to be um, not, not very sensitive at all. I have very thick skin. Um, so a lot of things that are said to me and um, done to me because of my color or because I'm a woman um, really very rarely face me. Um, and uh, part, in, in, in part because I don't think that there's space for that. There hasn't been space for that. I have a goal, I have things I need to accomplish, and if one person's gonna try to stop me from doing that, then I just sidestep them and move and figure out who else is gonna help me or where else I need to go to get that done. So I don't know what my colleagues experience, right? Because I live in my skin kind of a thing. Um, but I do think that it is a very different experience, right? Um, I think the one story that kind of popped into my head as you asked the question was um, far too many times, like I find myself um, misidentified in my role. Um, so for example, um, I remember one time I was at a conference um, of experts uh, in brain injury, because that's my, my specialty. And it was a work group, and there were a small number of us, and we were to be there for two days, and this was day one. And we convened at, say, 7 o'clock in the morning or so, and we worked all the way um, through the breakfast, which was continental, and then it was approaching lunchtime. And I got up to kind of stand, because we have been sitting all day, and I was in the general area of where the lunch was going to be served. And um, there were about a dozen of us, so it was not a huge number of individuals, and I'd been at the table the whole time. And one of the participants, uh, a man, uh, came up to the area where the lunch was going to be set up and started questioning me on the timing of the lunch set up and what was going to be served for lunch, etc. Um, and I was a little bit taken aback till I realized that he actually thought I was the service like staff, right? And I just stood there in complete shock that like I had been at a table with him for at that point about four and a half hours and I had been invisible the whole time because all he could see when taken out of context was that I was just this black person and then my role would of course be that of service, right? That was incredibly off-putting to me. Um, we stood there, I didn't say anything. And then he realized, and he went red and was like, oh my gosh, and then of course profuse apologies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
similarly, like, I mean, I can give you example after example after example. Um, at a neurosurgery conference, being asked to clear the coffee cups, right? Um, you know, uh, I mean, at one conference in Mississippi once, uh, waiting for my car, um, and I was the keynote speaker, and, uh, and someone then gave me their keys to valet their car. And I thought, this is crazy. Um, and it happened so repeatedly that for me, it's a clear testament to the fact that um, we can be so invisible. Like, you know, and very rarely do people ever make any association of me and my role. Um, and so I think that's a challenge that my colleagues probably don't face. Um, and it makes um, it makes it challenging to be heard because um, those only those stories kind of I think ex um, exaggerate the point of being invisible, right? Um, but uh, take you back to the actual scenario when you're sitting at a table, you know, translate that into how your words are received and what, and so you find yourself being that much more emphatic sometimes in trying to make a point, that much more thoughtful, etc. And I can't say for sure if um, it impacts my effectiveness because obviously I have no standard by which to judge it because it's just my whole world. But um, but that is a concern, and I think a lot of women and minorities feel that in their roles, right? That sense of like, are they actually listening to me? <laughs> Do they actually hear what I'm saying? Um, and then the, you you touched on the sense of isolation, and I think that that is profound for sure uh, because um, we do feel very isolated. Um, and um, I think for me, though, um, I've been able to create community um, in ways that have minimized that effectively, I think. <laughs> um, and um, I think in that journey, I have recognized the power of community. Um, and so um, I try to create it for myself always, and I try to strengthen it for others and be a part of others. Um, but I think it is important because um, it's difficult to uh, have that sort of um, uh, reality check sometimes. Like, you know, am I imagining this? Is this really happening, et cetera? Well, I'll say this. Um, I'll give an example. There are times when you walk into a room and you can see that your patient, if they're not a person of color, sometimes they're surprised that you walk in the room. And I've had a lot of people assume I was a nurse, nothing wrong with nurses, but you know, I'm a physician, so I think that that, um, that actually exemplifies some of the bias that we see in the medical field, right? You get bias based on gender, based on race, based on age, and I think I've had all of them, frankly. Um, but I, I've had some patients look at me with a doubting eye, and and honestly, you don't know if that's because they're feeling vulnerable, because I have a lot of cancer patients. You don't know if that's because of my gender. You don't know if that's because of my race. But I think that's an extra burden that we have to carry um, as women of color, um, wondering why is this person doubting me? And, and sometimes that's, I will admit, that, that could be me putting that on them. Uh, but I will say I've won over my, most, most of my patients, uh, if not all, on some level. And um, not that we have to win someone over, but there are people out there that frankly haven't gotten the memo that the stereotype of an old white man as a doctor is long gone. So I, I think that that's a reality that we have to face when we walk in the room is that sometimes the patients might themselves have a bias. Um, so back to my first year in medicine and what that was like, I think I probably sidestepped a lot of racism that I might not have known was there because I was still laser focused and um, some things might have happened that I might not have even realized, especially because I was a woman. Um, I think a lot of things happen or, um, or happen to me because I'm a woman and I don't realize it because I'm so laser focused in one direction. So I think this again is one of these things where it's a blessing and a burden. Um, and so um, I have had my fair share of people say they don't uh, want me to uh, participate in their care. Um, and I've had people call me 
the n-word I've had people um, tell me all the time people tell me oh well you look so young I just don't really know um, I've had people request different doctors I've had people assume that I was something other than a doctor I think we all have had countless stories like all probably black women in medicine have these countless stories um, and it becomes par for the course so um, it's almost like if you don't experience that then um, it's not a part of the true experience in some ways, as sad as that is to say, it's the reality. So in terms of being a woman of color in medicine, um, it's not necessarily lost on me that I'm one of very few um, academic practicing radiation oncologists and perhaps um, physicians in general um, in my academic arena. Um, and so that can sometimes, um, you know, feel uh, a little isolating, but I feel like I've been reasonably supported by colleagues throughout my journey. Um, and so um, I would say that in, in most instances, my um, immediate colleagues have never uh, made me feel like I was somehow different. Um, and so with that, I feel quite blessed. Um, however, um, in the more um, cultural um, surroundings of medicine, um, there are uh, situations in where, where either staff or other individuals um, kind of size you up just, you can kind of almost visibly see that um, sizing you up just based on things that they don't, may not know. But I've always risen above that kind of thing. Um, but um, one sort of example comes to mind is um, with regard to patients. I tend to be very forgiving of, of those kinds of behaviors that might indicate um, some issue or discomfort um, uh, because I usually I believe that people can get around that. And so a particular example is um, we work in teams with nurses and, and residents and um, on this particular occasion I walk into the room and the uh, patient comments um, on oh, are you my nurse? And so really, my way of dealing with that is really to diffuse uh, that kind of, uh, you know, somewhat, it's prob possibly microaggression, but, you know, um, statement, because I don't know whether or not that one was meant, um, you know, to be um, specifically damaging. So my response is, oh, thank you very much. Um, you know, our nurses do a wonderful job uh, but I'm actually your doctor. And so that gives an opportunity for that individual to um, to sort of recover and to know that uh, there's a space for continual learning. So that for me is always um, um, the approach. Um, but uh, I would say I'm, I'm feeling quite good about where I am in my career. Do feel very um, supported by those around me. Are there challenges uh, that we sometimes face um, that are more kind of cultural, there are, and so that's why it's important to me, very important to me, that we really focus on diversifying the, the workforce of medicine. They're such small things, right? So I've won awards and had things published, and those have all been really exciting, but um, I was away once for, I wasn't away, but I hadn't, I didn't take call for a month once. And I round in the morning with my residents, and um, and I came back and I knocked on the door to round, and the resident opened the door and was so excited to see me and hugged me and was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm so excited you're back!" And I thought, "This is awesome! <laughs> like, this is why I do this." You know, and of course he went on to be like, "You're the best! Like, I can't believe like you know we missed you, you you know blah blah blah." And I just thought. Wow, this is like a career highlight, and it was something like totally small, but um, but in that moment, really captured many things, right? Like the love of teaching, the love of working with younger, more diverse people than myself, um, the the commitment to patient care and excellence, um, the educational and academic environment we work in. Uh, all like really were captured in that moment and I just felt like this is why I do what I do so it was great I just loved it so not the Nobel Prize or anything but for me it was like yay so thank you um, 
Oh, feel free to share it more. Any other highlights? Oh, gosh. I mean, I don't want to go into, like, you know, awards and stuff. I think all of us, uh, you know, in our field get them, and they're definitely momentous. And for many of the awards, I'm, of course, like the first, you know, black woman or the first. And so those all have meanings. And I think as my kids get older, um, what's becoming more and more meaningful is their understanding of my work and the impact it has. And that's really affirming. And um, I think anytime I get a letter, a note, an email from a patient, I just feel like my head expands and my heart gets sunken. And I'm, or not sunken, but what full. And, uh, and it, I don't know, to me it's just awesome. So tell patients to write to me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, so why did you pick um, your specialty or how did you get into your biology and like really the the human brain like what like what what what, what was it yeah. about that like subspecialty that really was it in medical school like well do you have to pick a medical school like no you know, no yeah. you don't like yeah. what when did you know this was what you wanted to do um, I think the fit of a specialty to a person um, is different for everyone, but I truly hold that it it's visceral. Like, I don't think it's like an intellectual pairing, although it can be, but I'm not sure how happy those people are. Um, I think it's it, it visceral and intellectual, right? Um, and in medical, in res, sorry, in college, I took a neurobio class and I just thought, this is super. And then I did research in the neurosciences um, as a result of that class and still thought it was amazing. And so I kind of had an idea that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, but quite honestly, at that point, it was more intellectual than visceral because I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know any neurosurgeons. I'd never actually seen what they did, maybe watch TV, but you know, I didn't really fully understand it. So it was much more intellectual at that time. So when I came to Stanford, um, I was paired with some people who were interested in neurosurgery and neurosurgeons, um, but again, it was much at that cerebral level. And then I think spending time with them and the patients, et cetera, it became much, much more visceral. Um, but again, I think that's where mentors also played like a huge role. Um, I was paired with uh, both a preceptor and then later a mentor who were both neurosurgeons. Um, and the rest is history. I mean, both of them are just like the best neurosurgeons you could possibly imagine, but more importantly, the best people that you could possibly imagine. Um, gosh, they're just phenomenal. And phenomenal humans, phenomenal surgeons, phenomenal clinicians, great, great husbands and fathers and just people, you know? Um, and their love and passion for what they do is just unparalleled and outstanding. And I think um, that's what I wanted, right? And so then it became like a visceral match um, as well as an electoral match. And then I think the rest is just history. Um, because at that point, um, to try to dissuade someone from that is really quite hard. Um, and I think for most people will tell you when they find that, that specialty that speaks to them, it's really, both of those things coming together and then you just know that this is going to make you happy um, and if something really makes you happy then the length of the path and the rigor of the path is almost irrelevant really because it's you just know that's what you want to do um, and it doesn't matter if it's going to take you 20 years to get there or two right because um, uh, that's really highlights of my career first things that come to my mind are my children I have two little boys, ages four and three, and yes, I call them highlights of my career because they happened while I was doing my career, and um, that's my reality, and um, they're a part of my career. I owe them quite a bit. Like, they <laughs> have helped me in what I do and helped me in my role as a child and adolescent psychiatrist um, and how I think about things. Um, I think... Uh, along with that would be um, my uh, significant other, my husband, who um, has also been a highlight because in a lot of ways he has um, encouraged me along the way and um, it's because of him that I pursued certain programs, certain locations. That was the reality of what we were dealing with. I was a year behind him in training. Um, other highlights for my career, I recently published a, a book, co-authored a book with two um, other, three other psychiatrists, which I'm so excited about, like I never thought that I would be able to do something like that, so for me that's mind-blowing. 
Um, um, and it's really crazy, but a lot of fun and very rewarding. I think specifically within the work that I do, what's rewarding uh, is seeing my patients grow up and um, be successful, graduate high school, graduate college, make something of themselves. So the highlights of my career, um, firstly, graduating from medical school was very exciting uh, for me and my family, uh, first in my family to, to go on this uh, pathway, so uh, definitely one that I'm quite proud of. Um, and then the other real important part was uh, developing and ushering along um, a, an invention here at Stanford called the CyberKnife. Um, and really taking the lead on the applica applications of this new technology, and not only from the, si uh, the clinical standpoint, but organizationally and operationally building teams and realizing that, um, you know, if they're great ideas, you can bring great people together, um, and you really can um, bring ideas that can change the world. So to be re really a part of that, has been a phenomenal part of, of my journey. Um, I think the part of just kind of when you're having a hard time telling someone, and I know that can be really hard to do, um, but really kind of for me, it was like opening up to um, my advisor at the time because I was very worried about like my transcript and what my GPA looked like. And, you know, um, Ruby was very like candid, like, you know, Carmen, this is not a great GPA. Like, I see you're struggling here, but you're doing really well in here. And she told me you have to choose, like, either you're going to do really well in engineering or you're going to try to struggle and do both and then not get to where you want to be. So being open to getting that feedback, because I think a lot of times, um, it's hard to ask those questions and actually hear it and receive it and then try to make the changes that you need to do. Um, and then also realizing that failure is a part of the process and I think a lot of people don't want to hear that but I think I've learned my greatest lessons in failure um, and I think when you overcome that and you are better from it then it's all worth it because it's going to even make you a stronger you know, person just holistically, but also make you a stronger physician. It's going to make you a stronger um, advocate for your patients because I think we all struggle with failure, but being able to come back from it is, um, you know, really um, amazing to do. Um, I think the other thing is just finding mentors. You know, I am probably the stalkerish of like, you know, people. I come to Stanford events, I'm always looking for, I probably shouldn't use stalker, probably edit that out. But um, I always look for um, ways I can mentor up the next uh, generation of physicians because as I tell my patients, it's hard doing this job by yourself. I tell this to the kids, I'm like, I'm always looking for a new doctor. So whenever you're ready to start applying, let me know. Um, and I think it's the same thing when you're an undergrad. Like if you see a physician or you see them on the website, email them, reach out to them, touch base with them. And a lot of us are just waiting to just like help mentor you. But because we're so busy or we're wrapped up in residency or training, we don't get those opportunities to go actively like, you know, seek that out. So I think it's kind of got to go both ways. So if you know very early on this is what you want to pursue, just reaching out. We're literally just like steps away right there. You will get there. If this is what you want, you will make it happen. And don't let one bad grade, one bad score on an MCAT, having a best friend who has the best grades on the face of the earth, don't let any of that discourage you. None of it, because none of it matters. You yourself matter, and you yourself will be the one to, to get, you, get you to achieve your goals.